Hi, everyone, and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. My name is Peggy Ployer, and I am the host and weekly um, of this weekly broadcast, Empowering Homeschool Conversations, as well as the founder and CEO of SPED Homeschool. Um, we at SPED Homeschool empower families to home educate children with learning challenges, and I encourage you to check out our website at spedhomeschool.com to learn more about those resources and just how you can connect with them and get some encouragement, because um, that's what we're all about, um, encouraging and equipping families. And um, today we're going to just dive into that um, with my guest, Stephanie Buckwalter. Um, welcome, Stephanie. Stephanie, welcome back. Thanks for joining Thank me again. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Peggy. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. So today we're going to continue where we started last week. Um, this whole month we're focusing on broadcasts that um, just address specific questions when we have children who have medical issues that affect learning. And intellectual disabilities are, are one of those things. And it kind of covers a, a whole span of medically, um, I guess, precursors to, to why children don't learn. And um, so we aren't going to probably solve your problems, but we're going to help you from the parenting side on how to deal with a lot of the things that, that you face. And Stephanie is such a good person to have here because um, she is a mom, a homeschool mom, who's actually walked in those shoes and has a lot, a lot of wisdom to share with us. So I'm excited to have you here, Stephanie, to share on this topic. Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to make one small correction, is walking. My daughter's in high school. Oh, that's right. So yes, yes. Uh huh. intellectually disabled child. Um, yeah, well, you do it so good. I keep thinking that you've done it longer. <laughs> <laughs> The boys, the boys are gone now. The boys are all out of school. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think um, something good to, to bring up, too, is that we have a lot of partners who have older children, you know, high school or even beyond, and they continue to homeschool um, through even young adulthood because they find that their children with these more profound intellectual disabilities um, really have grown accustomed to this routine and the schedule within their home. So, so I want to encourage you as parents, um, we, we may say our homeschooling years are done and um, maybe they're going to continue a little longer, but it, <laughs> something to, to consider. But, um, but yeah, so as we get started, Stephanie, I would just love for you to share a little bit about yourself with our audience um, and, and just um, maybe some background on you and your family, and then what you what you do in the homeschooling realm. And I know we'll we'll kind of end also in in talking about that too. But um, just like people to get to know you and and how they um, just yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think I'm getting too chatty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine with me. Uh, my name is Stephanie Buckler. Sure. And I'm, I've homeschooled for over, over 17 years. I have five children. And I've actually taught all 12 grades now. And I've had children that are gifted, neurotypical, mild, and moderate special needs. So I've mm. had the whole gamut in our house. Yeah. And with different, all the different issues that come and go with those things. Um, I am an author, speaker, curriculum developer. I'm currently developing curriculum specifically for special needs kids mm. and you know anytime you want we can talk about that yes. in my spare time i like to spend <laughs> time in nature <laughs> when i ask her but i like to spend time in nature because it's just uh refreshing mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and i love to do research which is a good thing because when you have a special needs child and um especially one with intellectual disabilities and really no other diagnosis mm -hmm. or you know like overarching diagnosis, right? Then you get to do a lot of research anyway, so I just happen to like it too. So well, I that's good. Like perfect meeting place. Mm hmm. Yeah. That, and that's that's where I mean you. I've I've seen a lot of the things that you've written, and you know it's it's then it's just trial and error what works and what doesn't, and so but it's good that you you have a plethora of ideas that you can find, and and go from so <laughs> that's great. Um, I see we have a lot of viewers on with us. I just want you to know if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, 
that um, you can comment um, and you can ask questions as we're going along. If something just spurs a, a question specific to your homeschooling situation, we'd love to address that. Um, if you are watching on the Empowered Homeschool Network, um, just know that in order to comment so that we can see those, you have to click on the YouTube video and then we'll be able to and comment on YouTube. Otherwise, if you, you click on or you you make a comment on the Empowered Homeschool site, then we'll be able to come back and answer them later, but we don't see them live right here on this this platform. So um, that's just a, a little distinction. Um, last week, I know we had a lot of comments on there and I went, oh no, <laughs> there was a lot of people commenting and we didn't include those in the conversation. So um, just so you know that, that's um, how you can get um, connected with us here. But um, so as we're getting started, Stephanie, what are some of the biggest issues parents face when homeschooling or just in general parenting um, a child with an intellectual disability? Wow. I could, I could give you a list of like 20. Probably. <laughs> I'll try to group them. I'll pick like the top five or so. Okay. Uh, I think when it comes to homeschooling in particular, the thing that surprised me the most was stamina. Oh, That's like the number yeah. one thing. Because hmm. in my case, because my ID child has uh, brain anomalies, it's like teaching hmm. someone with a permanent concussion. And oh, that means wow. when she was actually got a chart on the symptoms of what a concussion looks like from the CDC website. Hmm. And I'm going to chart with the symptoms down the left side of the page and then how that presents in her on the right side of the page. Hmm. And that was so helpful, just getting wrapping my mind around what was going on. And when we, she would yeah. go places, it's like if she was in uh, a class at church or whatever, I could share, okay, if you start seeing these things, that means that she, her brain is overtired and you need to stop, <laughs> you know, uh, do something else, give her a brain. Yes. It's very, very helpful just to think of it like a concussion and really uh, just go to CDC website and look up the, you know, definition of a concussion. The reason <laughs> I like theirs, because theirs was really simple. They're right. A, um, you can get them anywhere, but that, that one was just really simple. Hmm. And then um, in addition to the intellectual disability that also relates to stamina is your child may have processing problems, seizures, right. your daughter had seizures, mm -hmm. um, Tourette's or Tourette's like tics that hmm. kind of get in the way, developmental right. delays, schizophrenia, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot that can go with intellectual disability. So you're not just dealing with one thing, but, um, and it's, but each of those creates stress on your child's system or That's it's a, a symptom point. of stress mm. on the system. Okay. Or yeah. It's a downward spiral of both. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You have, okay, this causes <laughs> stress on the system, and then that causes stress on your child. Mm -hmm. it causes stress on the system, and it's just like it spirals downward. So mm. all those things affect stamina. So stamina would be like the first thing I would think of. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's amazing. I didn't, you know, even think of that, that how much, you know, and it's it, a lot of times we just feel like we can just push them more and, the, you know, but you're actually making it harder when the stamina is falling. I'm just thinking about even, you know, working out, your body needs those rest points um, and your brain is the same way. It needs that time to repair and to, um, to build that back up before you can go again. So, yeah. So what else do you got for us? Uh, the second thing, a lot of times communication issues are coupled with um, intellectual disability. Yeah. And that's a big one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so cause my, my daughter has apraxia and she's nonverbal to a degree. She can say a few words. Hmm. She uses an AAC device to oh, okay. but yeah. just a few words. And she, at one point she knew up to 600 signs. Hmm. Um, that she could, I could say the word, she would give me the sign that she's lost some of those over time. So hmm. she uses a, a, a lot of different things to communicate, mm -hmm. but when it comes, but it's still the bottom line is I still don't know what's going on inside her head all the time. Yeah. I can see sometimes this is one of the hardest things I think seeing the frustration hmm. of, that she wants to say something, but she doesn't have the words. Right. But by the same token, on the positive side of that is I can see the intelligence that's there mm. because she if she doesn't have a word. Sometimes she can pull up when she was like four years old. She pulled up a sign that meant almost the same thing. And I was able to 
Wow. She said. Yeah. Uh-huh. And by the way, anyone else who has a child with ID or is non, uh, nonverbal, if your child laughs at things and sees humor in things, whether it's, you know, SpongeBob, Tom and Jerry, funniest mm-hmm. of videos, cat videos, if they're laughing at things, um, my daughter's physical therapist told us early on that that is um, a sign of intelligence, like higher order thinking. Oh, so if wow. your child gets humor, take that as a huge win. Hmm. <laughs> it's a huge that there's a lot more going on. That's so encouraging. It. Yes. Than you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And so, and I always say, always assume intelligence. Yes. I'm going to do a little side thing here. I don't know if you've ever read the book, Edo in Autism Land. I haven't. It, it's written by a young man who had autism and he learned how to communicate using Soma rapid prompting method. Hmm. He actually worked with Soma herself, which is kind oh. of cool. Huh. And so when he was about 12 years old, he started vlogging about all these things and he talked, he had severe, he has still to this day, I think he's about 21 now, hmm. but he has severe autism and, you know, with hand flapping and blank face, because he talks about this in his book, you know, the blank countenance and mm-hmm. things. And he just talked about what it's like living in that silent world. And so mm. if you have a nonverbal child, please do yourself a favor and read the book. Yeah. Yeah. And that's called Edo. Edo, I-D-O. Edo in Autism Land. It's on um, Amazon. You can get used copies. It's been out mm-hmm. for a while. And actually, okay. he just wrote, as a, as a 20-year-old, he wrote a fiction book called huh. Into Worlds. Hmm. And it's, he goes, now he assures us, I can't remember the name of the character. Let's say it's something like Joshua. He goes, I'm not Joshua and Joshua is not me. It is a work of fiction, but the emotions in it are real. So I bought that book and I read that one too. Oh, wow. So, um, if you get a chance, and I, I know it's a total aside, but especially if you have a nonverbal child and a nonverbal child with autism, that hmm. really gave me insight into um, what appears like an in. Uh, intellectual disability mm-hmm. may not be so much of that. We'll get to that towards the end. Uh, I'm guessing about um, neurological organization and how that plays into it. But yeah. for, for mm-hmm. right now, I'm still going yeah. on this issue. Well, you know, it's just, yeah, communication. That, that was the same issue with um, one of my adopted siblings. She um, basically had a brainstem and they really didn't think anything was going on. Um, and then my parents learned this, the method of eye gazing for communication and she started communicating and, um, it, it even shocked the, the brain surgeon that had worked with her. It's like, I had no idea she understood as much as she understands. Um, so you just don't know. And so assume intelligence. Yes, that is yeah. so important. Awesome. No matter what it looks like, assume that there is a working brain and mm-hmm. just make it out. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of that is, you know, behavior is, is communication. And we see a lot of behavior and sometimes we just get frustrated with it. But it is, it does lead to, they want to say something, they want to communicate, and we have to get to the bottom of it. So, awesome. So what else? <laughs> okay. Um Comprehension issues, which goes with communication. It's mm. sometimes, um, if you have communication problems too, it, it makes it hard for them to demonstrate their knowledge. Mm. And you mm-hmm. can't, you know, and we got a little, my daughter found, finally found the American Girl doll story. <laughs> ah, uh-huh. And so, <laughs> She's into the Welly Wishers, which is which are the fourteen and a half inch dolls for dolls for the younger kids, which okay. is fine. And so she's so she's been going to the store and all that stuff. And she bought a little book on friendship. And as I was reading it with her, I realized that so much of friendship depends on communication. Yeah. And um, just I just realized that I was talking about comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but so much of friendship depends on communication. And mm. when behavior is an issue, communication is it's on the negative end and the positive end. Right. So yeah. teaching manners and all that um, is very helpful. So mm-hmm. back to comprehension. <laughs> yeah. So without comprehension, it's hard to know what your child knows, what they're thinking, what questions exactly. they might have. Mm-hmm. Like trying to second guess every question. Because now I have... A grandchild who's two so he's just starting to talk 
and mm. or even just watching videos on YouTube, seeing these little kids, and they just have all these questions. Mm -hmm. And I used to feel bad about that, that, you know, my daughter had all these questions and I couldn't answer them or I, I didn't even mm. know what to answer. You know, right. Yes. Yeah. But because comprehension is slow to come also with intellectual disability, she probably mm. wasn't ready for those at that age anyway. Mm. And, um, and once she got some ability to communicate, it was, I had a much better idea of at least what she was thinking of. Hmm. And the one other clue to that comprehension is there, that there's a lot of comprehension, mm -hmm. and it's a normal progress uh, process with a neurotypical child is at, in the beginning, they just point to and talk about things in their immediate environment. Mm -hmm. And then one day they ask about something that's not in the room with them. And I remember when my oh, daughter was wow. Asleep, yeah. mm -hmm. because she was trying to communicate something. And before it was very easy. I would just look around the room and say, okay, that's what she's talking about. Uh -huh. And she got to the point and I, and it was exciting. So I was like, she comprehends that there's something beyond what's in this room right this minute. Mm. And it's so exciting. But comprehension is still difficult and it's hard to tell what she knows. Mm. Yeah. Even to this day. Yeah. But but that insight that, that you had that that she took that leap. Um, you know, we, we sometimes wonder if our students are getting, you know, if they're progressing. And, and so finding progress in some very unique ways versus, you know, a checklist that shows us that the progress has happened, but, um, but looking for it and observing for it and watching changes um, to notice progress is important too. It's great. So, yeah, let me pull up um, questions here. So another thing is just demonstrating progress and we kind of talked about this already it's just hard to demonstrate for her to demonstrate what she knows because with intellectual mm. disability you may not get the same answer every time or the right answer or you know the right answer i know she knows the right answer but she can't get it on demand i have yeah. noticed that with intellectual disability if i just keep putting stuff into her head and yes if I ask her what I just said, she can't do it. But mm -hmm. down the road, I will see her initiate something with me that shows that she does know that. Ah, so yeah. that's the other thing is these kids have a hard time initiating mm -hmm. conversation or friendship or even getting a task done. Hmm. She's having a hard day when she's having, um, when it's more concussion like than others, she will not be able, I'll say, you know, go you know she asked for a glass of water and i'll say this was just yesterday <laughs> right so I'll, I'll say well you go get it you know i'm sitting mm. here right next to you and i don't want to get up either and, <laughs> but she kept doing that throughout the day and i realized that she was just her brain was telling probably telling her body to do that but she couldn't initiate the action to go do it so there are days uh -huh. like that too that, and that's all I'm guessing that's all part of the intellectual disability. It's just hmm. the inability to initiate and and produce answers on demand. Yeah, yeah. It, it's got to be so hard to constantly struggle for, is this what I'm dealing with or not? You know, and there's so many things as a parent with um, all the issues that your, your child has, and they affect us as a parent. Um, how have parenting your daughter affected you um, and not just, you know, as in parenting, but as well as in teaching. Um, can you share a little bit on that? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't cry. <laughs> that's that's okay. I cry every once part. in a while too. <laughs> this is the hard part of the talk. Mm. Um, I think the hardest thing is kind of what we talked about a little bit earlier about not knowing what she doesn't know what she does know yeah not just not being able to connect on an intellectual level hmm. is really hard and i know a lot of parents have the problem they can't connect on an emotional level either right my daughter her she's never really cried she hmm. something whatever's wrong with her brain she, no tears come out hmm. and she'll have to say on her ipad she'll say sad 
Ah. And we don't know what she said. But wow. I can't tell any other way if she doesn't mm-hmm. actually tell me. And so that's always been really hard. And then as far as teaching, that thing about not being able to get the same answer twice in a row, to know mm-hmm. if you really mm-hmm. got it. And as a matter of fact, we were doing a computerized math program. And I had set the level at 80%, saying she has to get 80% right before she mm-hmm. can move the le- rep, uh, next lesson. And I think she actually knew how to do stuff. She just couldn't get the answers right. She got enough of them right. Mm-hmm. So I lowered it to seven. And then she wanted, she didn't want to do the math program anymore. Because mm. I think it was, she do it. She just didn't want to have to do the same lesson over and over. Right. So I lowered the percentage that she had to get right to 70%. And then all of a sudden she was fine. Hmm. So, because I think she knew the material well enough to move on. Right. And it goes back to when you were talking about earlier, sometimes she just can't pull that information out when it's necessary. And that can be frustrating knowing that you know the answer, but I just don't know where to find it at that time. And so, so an accommodation. And I think a lot of times we think that accommodation is means that they don't know it, but you knowing your daughter know that that is probably enough that she does know it. It's just, there's another, there's something else going on. Well, and I was clued into that from the, from Edo in autism (laughs) land, because he talked about that. He said he can tell his body to do something. So my daughter has apraxia, which is Mm. akin to dyspraxia, which is, it's all both of motor planning, one of them specific to speech, mouth stuff, Mm. usually, uh, technically. I mean, that's how we use it related to speech and dyspraxia is when your body doesn't motor plan correctly. Mm. And so the whole area of motor planning is another problem you can have with intellectual disability right. that, um, and that's, that's kind of where that comes from. And so mm. he talked about that. He talked about, he would tell his brain to do something and he couldn't do it, or he would try to point at something and he knew the right letter. He knew the right answer, but his hand wouldn't go to the right place uh, or at the time someone told him to go give flowers to his aunt and there were too many people and he was too frustrated so he just handed his grandfather and so they thought well mm. he doesn't know his aunt is and so they spent all this time telling him who his aunt is he goes I know who my aunt is you know anyway it's kind of crazy uh-huh. so that kind of clued me in to start looking at um things like that so I've started looking mm. at especially after reading that book that just assuming a much, much, much higher, almost average level of intelligence hmm. that just can't get out. Right. And it, I mean, so now that she's a teenager, that, that I probably wouldn't have thought that in the early years. Mm-hmm. But there's just so much more going on there. So that intellectual disability is frustrating, but it's also, I see there the encouragement comes when I'm teaching her and she gets something even that one time, even though she mm-hmm. mixes it the next four times, she got it the one time. And that's my big clue that yes, she got it and we can move on. Right. Have to stay there because what happened with my daughter was in public school for a few years. Mm-hmm. And what I noticed there was, and it happens in homeschool too. So it's not just the public school system and just, mm-hmm. the record, I loved all of her teachers that she ever mm-hmm. had and they were all kind to her. But the school, the public school system just can't do what we can do at home, nor can yeah. we do what the public school system does. So it's, <laughs> so it's not comparing apples to apples. Really. Right. Yep. But mm-hmm. she was there for a time and she was what I call caught in perpetual kindergarten. Mm-hmm. It's in the mm-hmm. school system and we can kind of get caught up in this in home school too. In the school system, they're required to show progress because of IDEA, the Disabilities Act. Yep. Um, and so they are required by law to do this and all the IEP meetings and all that stuff. Right. And all the testing and the, yeah, the, but the what progress happens, reports. Mm-hmm. You know, and we can do as, as homeschool parents, even with our special needs child, we can get so caught up in those deficit skills mm-hmm. that we, excuse me, kind of drop the, the other academic things. Yeah. And so my whole goal with my daughter is to remediate her, you know, three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing addition in high school is where we're at. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, keep teaching her about the world around her through science, through social studies, through social skills, 
because I want her, even though she won't be able to process fast enough to participate in a regular conversation unless someone's, you know, focused on her, mm-hmm. like a group of people. But if someone's sitting there talking about um, the coronavirus or if they're talking about um, vaccines or if they're talking about um, what else, the, you know, the Revolutionary War or George Washington or mm-hmm. World War II or whatever it is, you know, the boys, we talk about the wars all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that she does, she's not lost in the conversation. She won't just have to tune it out because she has no clue what they're talking about. Right, so she has some context. Mm-hmm. We mediate the three R's, but give as much education as possible in the right. all areas. Just yeah, so you're just enriching yeah, her, enrich, her life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good word for it, enriching. Yeah, that's so important. Um, We have a question from a viewer. Do you mind if we add that into the mix? Okay, Karen asks, um, social opportunities for neurotypical homeschooled students can sometimes be limited or a bit of struggle to find. How have you found social opportunities for your homeschooled IDD child? For me, we, um, her friends (laughs) come from one of two places. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is church because we have our church happens to be a larger church with a disabilities ministry. And That's so helpful. there mm-hmm. are people there her age uh, that have most of them have autism. But unfortunately, they're boys. <laughs> <laughs> There's one with Down syndrome, but they're they're boys. And so there was one girl there and she hung out with her. But now she just moved away. So we have mm. a, another girlfriend to play with. Yeah. And my daughter-in-law who's uh, married my oldest son so she's been in the family for a couple of years now and as a matter of fact that's where my daughter is right now while I'm doing this Ah. (laughs) I had to run her over to their house and she kept saying I want to go to my friend's house oh so that's really where we get our friends is among family from Mm -hmm. church I haven't really found any in the homeschool community locally even Mm -hmm. though some of those people at church homeschool it's the problem. The hardest thing is even when you're in the special needs community, they're so different from mm-hmm. each other that it's hard to connect. And I, the one thing I struggle with though, I will mention is thinking I have to be her friend, like oh. I'm her friend. And so I have to be all these things Very for her. Mm-hmm. I still to this day, I go back and forth on that because you know, you have to be mother and teacher and friend mm-hmm. and therapist. And right. <laughs> yeah, so, you, so you end up being all these things and separating mm-hmm. out those roles. So I'm sorry I don't have a really good answer for you. <laughs> but uh, that's where we have found ours so far is in a church with family and with really any mm-hmm. adult who will take an interest in your child is yeah. probably the best way I can say that. So find someone you trust mm-hmm. who will be kind and don't leave them together for too long initially because you know right. how hard it is for you with your child. Mm-hmm. It's 10 times harder for someone who's not grown up with a child or been around that child. But mm-hmm. you also want to, you know, protect your child <laughs> because there right. are some, you know, I've heard horror stories of leaving them with the wrong people, usually mm-hmm. related with the opposite sex. So just right. don't do that. <laughs> don't yeah. ever, ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do that. Even this was a even like with a trusted friend of the family. Mm-hmm. So yeah. But but yeah, just find people who are willing to take an interest. Usually, older or what I've also found my daughter is she either plays with kids who are a lot younger or people who are older than her. Hmm. Since uh, she's not really so peers, especially anywhere middle school to mm-hmm. high school, they just think they're too caught up in their own self-image and stuff Mm -hmm. it's really hard for them to get outside themselves and be kind to someone unless they grew up with someone like that or has someone like that in the family right yeah yeah my parents have found that their best pcas come from homeschooled fam large homeschool families (laughs) who are used to lots of kids around a lot of time and um and so they actually use them as pcas at their their house and they are like buddies but really 
to my siblings have become their friends because that is it's either who's ever in the house is their friend and and their sibling um, or these buddies that come in and will maybe take them shopping because they are a little bit older um, and and can go out and do activities with them but but yeah that one-on-one you get into a group setting and they get lost Um, either they become the really loud one or they become the one who you know everybody's forgot about because they're so quiet enough you know and don't want to do all the group activities and so yeah so so that's some some good advice yeah just it's unique too Mm -hmm. yeah great question karen yeah so we were talking about just um you know how you as a parent have been affected um is there anything else you have to share on that Since my daughter is the youngest child, I, I'm not really affected like this, but I know there are people who are affected with, they have siblings and they can't just devote all their homeschool time. Cause right. Mm-hmm. Child before I had, you know, five kids at once. Right. So I've done <laughs> I remember what that's like. And so you, so I have to do what I can. And again, I think for me, the biggest thing is, keeping in, I have this little graphic that I made to help myself, just that we're created for three things. I I thought about this. I thought, okay, Hmm. she's getting close. You know, why did God create us? And how does that apply to my daughter? Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, we're created for relationship. Mm -hmm. So, um, or we're created for relationships. You know, there's social connection. We're created for work in the Garden of Eden said here. Mm -hmm. so being productive in some way and now with our kids I've had to think through that and say well she's never a job (laughs) she's never going to go to college but for her being productive can be serving the family by doing dishes you know unloading the dishwasher Mm -hmm. creating little works of art in school or even creating a little lap book Mm -hmm. acts of productivity related Mm -hmm. to work so I don't look at it as just you know working a job it's being productive, I I kind of put it in three things, being productive, serving others, or uh, creating a piece of art, a workable Mm -hmm. art of some kind. And then the third area is, um, I always forget this. (laughs) Oh, productivity, (laughs) I put academics under productivity. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I can't remember the last one. We're creating for three things, I know it. (laughs) So wait, social connection, productivity, and oh, maturity, independence, to grow, because you know, Mm -hmm. we're if you look, you know, a tree starts with a seed and it matures. Mm. And, you know, oh, that's good. It's just mm-hmm. We live in cycles from baby to maturity. Yeah. And for our kids, that means independence, focusing mm. on mm-hmm. helping them become as independent as they can. And yeah. if, you, if you question whether or not they actually want to be independent, I encourage you to look at people. Uh, my mother-in-law lived with us when she had Alzheimer's and she was losing her independence. Especially mm. when my daughter was three who was, and my, and my mother-in-law was, you know, 70, and they were, like, about the same age mentally there for a while. Hmm. But she tried to hang on to her independence as long as possible. So our kids do want that independence. So those are the three yeah. things. Mm-hmm. Relationship, uh, productivity, and independence. Hmm. I and I call that. independence also includes self-government. Hmm. How mm-hmm. to govern yourself through social skills, through... Um, know you know your home skills your self-care skills all that falls mm-hmm. in yeah yeah that's that's good because yeah we we can put value and in so many things in so many places but i, I love that that those three things because you can you can fit everything into each one of those categories and um say how are we doing here you know and and how am i doing as a parent in allowing my child to move in this direction too, because we can sometimes undercompensate, overcompensate. And Karen said that she loves that insight. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. So, so yeah. Um, so what are things that you did then to combat these homeschooling hurdles? Let's see, I have to think back because I did different things at different ages. But the one thing that I would encourage anyone to do whose child has problems communicate is make that your number one. 
thing is teaching them how to communicate. And we, that can be through gestures, through hmm. pointing, you know, through sign language and through using an AAC device, mm -hmm. any little bit of communi additional communication you can give them, the better. Now, one thing I ran into is, so the people in society tasked with teaching communication on an AAC device or speech therapist, mm. and most, with very few exceptions, most of the ones I know teach AAC like they're teaching speech. They're not teaching communication. They're teaching oh, speech. They're just teaching on a words. Device. Never even thought about that. Uh, yes, I had mm. several conversations with mm -hmm. them about that. And people, a lot of times, couldn't grasp that. No, that's, you know, that's speech. That's parts of speech. That's putting a sentence together. Right. If her ability to communicate is three words like a toddler, then let her just use the three words. Don't force her to use a, a complete right. sentence. Because then it's not getting to the point of what you want to use it for. It's, it's just, it's, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's teaching, so they, because with speech, they're teaching them how to say things. You know, it's just, it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. And they don't fault them for it. That's what they're trained to do. They're right. They're trained to teach mm -hmm. speech. But I wish there was a separate program, and maybe one day there will be, for teaching communication. So, mm. so that was one thing that I've tried to focus on a lot is, getting real communication going because without that um you're it's frustrating <laughs> that's yeah I say. Mm -hmm. that's the best word I use for us <laughs> forever um mm. other things I've done is like I said I filled out that little concussion sheet like mm -hmm. okay if right. headaches does she ever complain of having a headache mm. um tires easily does she, you know, if she's doing this, you know, if she's reading or if she's using an app on an iPad and we're sitting side by side using it together, how mm -hmm. long can she do that? Oh, you know, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. After 15 minutes, we need to stop and she needs like a 15 minute break. Mm -hmm. So giving breaks. And I found also that by doing that, we actually reduced her seizures. So oh, really? Because apparently a seizure is, I'm not a medical doctor. Don't take this as advice. <laughs> okay, caveat, uh, disclaimer. So apparently it's just an electrical release in the brain. Hmm. Well, I could see her seizures coming on two or three days in advance because she would start having like absent seizures, which she would stare, you know, stare, and then, you know, come back to, you know, stare and come back. Yeah. Uh -huh. That would usually start happening two or three days before, and then she'd go in the full tonic pass out seizure. Wow. <laughs> shake mm -hmm. and body thing and have to give a medicine called 911 a couple of times. Hmm. So when I started paying more attention to reducing the cognitive load, it mm -hmm. reduced the seizures. Hmm. And that was huge. And, you know, recognizing yeah. it coming on the days right. up mm -hmm. to it. So, and what that really meant sometimes was just half days of school. Hmm. So, and that should be an encouragement if you're homeschooling multiple kids, your ID child should not be able to handle a full day of school. Full day. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have found that if I don't push her, she learns a lot more in those shorter time frames than if yeah. I try to get a longer school day. Mm -hmm. so, you know, just a few hours a day seems to be about right for her. And they're not mm -hmm. always back to back. We've gotten to where we oh, can go. Yeah an hour to an hour and a half if I put the fun subject last in that mm -hmm. half. <laughs> Some <laughs> <Notice>. motivation. <laughs> yeah. And we, we rarely go the full hour and a half in a block of time. And then mm -hmm. we'll take a break. But then it's lunch. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll do more afterwards. And I also learn uh, giving her the schedule. I know a lot of people are familiar with that a written schedule. Mm -hmm. And if your child needs a visual schedule, you know, little pictures of what you're doing. Right. Um, I just use words now. I used to use pictures in the hmm. beginning. Now we're where I can, you know, she can read the word. Um, what else have we done? Those were, those were big ones, working on communication, working on um, the, you know, figuring out exactly how long she could go at right. one time. And so I didn't plan. That was the other thing I had to learn how to do was how to plan my day, her, her school day, 
because with the boys I could do, okay, at nine o'clock, we're going to do math. Yeah. Yep. Do this, mm -hmm. right? So I just have to go, okay, from nine to 1030, we're going to do school and we're mm. going to try to get these three subjects done uh -huh. in that hour and a half, however long it takes. If it takes mm -hmm. 30 minutes or if it takes an hour and a half, it's yeah. all good. And adjusting. And then once that's over, just, then we, I just have a longer break. Hmm. <laughs> to get other mm -hmm. things done. I still sit with her if it's school hours. Right. I will still sit with her while, and she can do something, you know, we do parallel play. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just like little kids, mm -hmm. just like, just like yeah. little toddlers, we do parallel play. And I'll get on my computer and do my stuff, but I'm still with her during that school time. Hmm. And that mm -hmm. seems to help her regulate herself. Okay. And, um, that's another thing I learned is co-regulation hmm. <laughs> when I think the term comes from people who have been through abusive situations and all this stuff. That's, that's where I oh, saw this. One. Okay. And if they're out in public and they start freaking out or whatever, and they have someone come alongside them, who's calm, who can talk them back from the ledge. Mm -hmm. I've learned that if I behave in a certain way, it will trigger her hmm. <laughs> more than if I, if, but if I can stay calm and right. exhibit in the moment the behavior that I want her to have hmm. emotionally, it's I think that's called co-regulation. And so right. it brings mm -hmm. her down off the edge. The other thing I know about her, which I'd encourage you to learn about your own ch children, is she takes about 15 minutes to come down off the ledge when she she cannot, like when hmm. she she's had it and she's like way out of control. Mm-hmm. And I always said it was about 15 minutes, but this past week, this happened and we told her she couldn't have the iPad back. So we were afraid she was going to break it. It's her communication device. So she has it at all times. She always, mm -hmm. had it but, um, she was doing things that could break it. And so we took it away for 30 minutes. We set the timer on the stove. Setting a hmm. timer is another good thing. Yeah. Because even though she doesn't know what 30 minutes is, mm -hmm. she can look at that timer and see if they're still time left on it then it's not time yet so i don't right. know how much of that time but the fact that there are numbers moving on the clock mm -hmm. means that it's not time yet and she's kind of learning she she knows to count down from three for 30 minutes to two to one and then mm -hmm. she's there eventually. Mm -hmm. but um so we set the timer for that and it was almost exactly 15 minutes when she was able to self-modulate and not uh, freak out about not having the iPad in her possession. Hmm. And for the last 15 minutes, she just stood there and kept asking for it. But, but she was not <laughs> yelling about it. It was great. Right. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, And I stay calm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's the other thing I do. Even if we're having a bad school day, I still say, okay, well, it's school hours. So we're going to sit here. Oh. And I have to do a lot of waiting when she's having a bad day. Sometimes mm. we don't have to do any of this stuff. But when it's a bad day, I just have to sit there and say, okay, well, if you're not ready, sometimes I'll move on to a different subject. Mm -hmm. And other times I'll say, you know, say, we'll come back to it. Or I'll yeah. just sit there and say, okay, if you're not ready, that's fine. We'll just sit here until you're ready. Hmm. And then I don't do anything else. I just sit there. Right. So you're not rewarding not doing anything. It's just, yeah. we're just waiting. But, and that's yeah. one of those signs that there's more going on in those little heads than we would imagine <laughs> because they are manipulating at times. Right. So, and that's another hard thing is, are they trying to get their own way mm. or is it hard? That's an intellectual ability. When they get frustrated, your kids can, um, can rebel or refuse yeah. to do the work or whatever. Mm -hmm. and without that communication piece, it's like, even with the communication piece, right. is it because it's too hard? Mm -hmm. is it because it's boring? Is it because, yeah. you know, could be, is, you know, the moon and stars aren't in a light, right? Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> exactly. It could be anything. <laughs> you know. um, so, and then it, if your child also has sensory problems, which I know a lot of them do, mm -hmm. and that's another big thing is checking the environment. One thing I learned about my daughter, and it was interesting, I learned it from her sitting on the trampoline in the summer. Uh, someone hmm. gave us a trampoline. So the first year we had it, she was out there. She got up from the trampoline and the backs of her legs were red from sitting hmm. on it. And so I realized that her clothes may have the, that spandex stuff in clothes. Right. 
I don't know how that relates to the trampoline, but in my mind it worked. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's the that spandex, same rubbery type of. Yeah. Anything with spandex in it. And of course, all blue jeans now. Almost yes. every pair has they have that at least stretchy. A bit of that. Mm -hmm. And so for a while, I got rid of all that stuff, and her behavior, her attitude improved. And you hmm. know, it was always better because it was just, you know, cotton shorts, cotton shirts. Right. So environment, environmental factors. Mm -hmm. Just looking at everything, and it's exhausting. <laughs> Right. That is just yeah. exhausting. Mm. So that's, um, but after, over time, you know, you mm -hmm. just look at one thing at a time and you learn and then homeschooling gets, I don't know if it gets easier, but it definitely. Right. But you, gets. but you gain more insight so yeah. that you have something to pull from and it isn't just a large frustration. I mean, yeah, you got a lot of time while you're sitting there waiting. <laughs> Might as That's well right. pray, say, yeah, okay, God, we need to solve this problem next. What am I not seeing? You know, and I noticed that with my son, too, when he, I didn't realize he was having back issues. A lot of it was coming out as behavior, and he has a debilitating back condition. Um, and I'm like, just open my eyes, God, let me see what is going on. And I noticed he was hunched over. Never before had I noticed that. Why? Because, you know, you're busy in your home and you don't realize these things until your eyes get opened. And then that understanding gives you so much compassion then too. And, um, and I, I just hear you speaking that over and over again, you know, as, as you have understood your daughter, you know, just moving yourself into her world and, um, and teaching her from that perspective versus, you know, what, all these other people outside are telling you this is what homeschooling needs to look like and this is how you need to, to fix your child <laughs> and instead entering her world and teaching her from there and it's just beautiful um i just thank you for um for just allowing us that insight into um into your life stephanie because it's it's beautiful um, you'll feel like i'm not <laughs> <laughs> doing it very well well many times we don't but you know it's the end result and our kids are very patient and gracious to us <laughs> hmm. so can you share some encouragement for parents who are feeling frustrated right now and homeschooling their student with an intellectual disability um what, what do you want to be their their top takeaway from what you shared the Well, this will kind of go into my neurological thing that I was talking about earlier. Mm. This was a huge eye opener for me. I've taken a lot of, because I'm older and I've had time, I've had years, you know, when my child was in school, I've been, I've been able to take advantage of different training in different mm. areas, like nutrition, mm -hmm. neurological organization. Um, and then kind of what we've been talking about is the nurture aspect. I call it the three ends, nurture, nutrition, and neurological organization. And on the neurological organization part, that's really my heartbeat because that's what's made the biggest difference for my daughter. And the, if you've had your child tested, they probably were given an IQ score and it was probably pretty low. Mm. <laughs> if your, if your child is a moderate or severe disabilities. Mm. So I think what is nor what is, what is considered average? Is it like 70 or something like that? I, I think 70 is, yeah. So anything below 70, you know, you're thinking, oh. but this one training that I had, kind of putting together with all the other stuff I had learned, mm -hmm. what I learned was the your IQ score is not an intelligence quotient. Mm -hmm. It's really a neurological organization quotient. Mm. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the ability of your child to think to process to all that stuff. Mm. Well, I mean, the process kind of, but it's really a measure of their neurological organization. So if you think of a scale, mm. and the top here is gifted, you know, profoundly gifted, you can have all right. that, use the same language on the bottom end of it. Uh -huh. so if you start yeah. gifted up here, and you have your neurotypical average, and then down here is what's considered um, intellectually disabled, anything below 70. Mm. And you can have mild ID, you can have moderate, severe, profound, and mm -hmm. if you're below profound, then you're in a coma. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, and coma is your lowest state of neurological organization. Mm -hmm. Profound, you only have a little bit of neurological organization. So the higher you go up that school, so gifted people aren't really smarter than everybody else. They just have right. their neurological organization mm -hmm. and you can process stuff better. So, mm -hmm. what I, so when I say assume intelligence, 
Right. Assume your child really can do and knows a lot more than you can possibly imagine because that all that stuff, all those diagnoses, whether it's Mm -hmm. autism or cerebral palsy even or MS or all those things, Mm -hmm. um, Down syndrome, yes, that one, you know, has a distinct genetic component to it. Mm -hmm. And but they are all related to neurological organization. The reason they Mm. have a diagnosis is because they are not neurotypical, which means you Mm -hmm. have average neurological organization. So what I want people to understand is it's there. Don't ever forget that it is Mm. in your child. And if you are not, um, I'm I'm especially speaking to those whose children are in the below average. Mm Mm-hmm intellectual range and I guess that would be intellectual disability so I'm really talking to those people that um you your homeschooling like Penny was saying may not look like you thought it would or Mm. you think it should or other people tell you it should or because to reach your child you will have to do things differently Mm. and you will have to kind of make your own way through it at this, you know, based on your child, as we were talking about earlier, everybody's child is different. Even if you're right. a whole group of, uh, you know, special needs 16 year olds, then they're all different. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know it in the autism community, they say, if you see, if you've got one kid with autism, you've got one kid with autism. What's right, exactly. Thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, I mean, it's there. I'm still praying that God will show me a way to draw it out and I can share it with everybody else. Hmm. People have found ways. So my three ends are after studying and researching all these years, those are the three ways that I have seen people reach their children with intellectual hmm. disability through nurture, which is what we're talking, you know, creating the environment where they can right. feel emotionally safe so that mm-hmm. they can um, prosper. Yeah. Nutrition because every single time I've done a nutritional integration intervention with any of my kids with all of their problems, mm-hmm. they've gotten better. Sometimes yeah. a little, sometimes a lot. And mm-hmm. so you know, nutrition is a huge it is. piece yes. of mm-hmm. the intellectual disability problem as far as neurological organization. It doesn't neurologically organize you. Oh, right. That's the next one. The third one is neurological But it, but it refines it and it, it, it optimizes it, definitely. It allows it. Yeah, it makes it easier to happen. And neurological mm-hmm. organization deals with movement. You improve that through movement. Mm. And if nothing else, start walking. If mm. you need um, Sue Patrick with Workbox, the work mm-hmm. system, she talked about her son with autism and she got a treadmill. And she, you know, and that was part of school was walking on that treadmill every mm. day. And I'm convinced that just because we're created to walk, to run, to, you know, mm-hmm. to move it that way, that's our right. basic uh, motor locomotion mm-hmm. is walking, that if you can just go walking with your child, that alone will improve um, neurological organization. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just <laughs> recommending it based on <laughs> what I've observed. And it's, and then if you can get there are also things like retained reflexes you can deal with and mm-hmm. look at. Um, I've taken courses in that and kind of like the brain gym activities or the book Smart Moves. All right. of those are what I'm talking about here with helping with neurological organization. Mm-hmm. So that, mm-hmm. that's it. So the main takeaway after all that, the main <laughs> takeaway is it's in there. And right. do, do what you can to bring it out. And it mm-hmm. doesn't have to look. It only has to be, because some of our kids, I think you can improve neurological organization, which means their IQ would go up. I just mm-hmm. don't know how much or how fast. Right. But, And it's a number. It, 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 it's a number. But but yet you are, yeah. It, what's most important is they're, they're getting more organized and they com- communicate and they can live in the world that they're in that's, better. That's it. Right. So, so you get them to the point where, you know, remediate the three R's as much as you can and then mm-hmm. give them enrichment so that they can function in the world that they're going to be in as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. We got kind of a question about kind of that end of high school 
time uh, onto adulthood. Um, we'll slip that in real quick at the, before I have you share um, where people can find you. Um, one of our YouTube viewers asked, thanks for sharing all that information. I can totally relate to all kids, no matter what, receive a school completion certification or diploma that might be handy for applying for jobs. So uh, I don't know where she lives, so I'm sure you'll address that too. <laughs> yeah, and schools hand out diplomas. And if you're in a, you can go on your state education website and it will tell you what kind of diplomas your state offers. Mm -hmm. And so you would choose the diploma that your child could complete. Um, if your child is in high school and not able to get what's called a standard diploma, so you can look up your state name and the words standard diploma, and that'll at least take you to the right page. And you should be able to find the other ones. HSLDA.org. Yes, we'll also have that's information a good one. on mm -hmm. high school graduation. When it comes to special needs, if your Washington. child is going to have a regular job uh, without supports, then my guess is they would, if they can complete the work, then it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. If they can't complete the work of a standard diploma, then you can get a special diploma or certificate of completion or whatever your state would call it. Yeah, and it depends, it really depends on the state, because some states you can actually, because you are a private school, you set the standards for the diploma, and it can be, um, it can be considered almost a, a, a standard diploma to, that, um, that they give out, because I know in some states they give a standard diploma to any child that graduates, whether they're, whether in the special needs program or not. Um, so, so it would depend, and I'm not exactly, I'm not so versed on Washington State, um, but you know what? If you join us next week, guess what? Next week on my program, I'm going to have one of the high school HSLDA consultants on. And oh, she's going to talk about homeschooling her daughter with diabetes. So she would be the person to ask. <laughs> so um, so that might be a, a good in. But also check out, like Stephanie said, HSLDA.org. And um, they would have information about your state laws as well as they have a, a struggling learner special needs department too that would help with with that with those laws so but um but thanks for that question so we just got a few minutes left stephanie i would love for you to share with our viewers um just how they can connect with you as well as um i know you, you've got some incredible resources on your website that people can tap into right now and a few things that say they're coming this year and i'm super excited about them <laughs> okay thank you um my website is art of special needs parenting.com see it right here on the screen it yep. disappeared <laughs> <laughs> oh it it's away. it's now now it's in oh, a big okay. one yes <laughs> okay. there it is right down there uh art of special needs parenting.com and there is um I started it and then COVID happened and then I started creating all these resources and stuff behind the scenes. And so my website uh, is kind of sparse right now, but there is something called the SOS library. So that's mm -hmm. for help, for quick help. And there's uh, some help for different things. And also if you are thinking about pulling your child out of public school and homeschooling, there is a document on there and it tells you what you need to know about how to do that. The other one's just awesome. some general help. And I have a, I'm currently working on a toolkit, a teacher prep toolkit for hmm. before you have, um, normally you have a scope and sequence, like if you right. have curriculum, mm -hmm. this is your scope and sequence. So this is what you're going to teach this year. And this is how you're going to do it. Right. With special needs, you often have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's all creating and it's almost ready. <laughs> it's almost ready. I thought it was going to be ready at the end of January. Um, <laughs> It should be ready by the end of this month. It's awesome. a toolkit that has where you set your scope, just setting your goals, and then a how to evaluate curriculum for your special needs child based on your goals. And then mm -hmm. the third part of the toolkit, or it's actually a, the third toolkit, is the planning part, which is mm -hmm. your sequencing. So it's supposed to help you do that whole scope and sequence thing mm -hmm. based on your, for your child. And then That's I'm awesome. also working on curriculum, like I mentioned earlier, specific to special needs children, especially those who are ID, who can't communicate. Mm -hmm. And with the idea that I said where you're remediating the three R's, but the rest right. of it is all enrichment. And then to show you how to do that, and I have a specific method, it's, um, it's called the ELARP method. 
and hmm. it's explore, label, apply, reason, produce. Hmm. And so uh, the label, apply, reason, if you're familiar with classical education, you might see that in there. Oh, the, okay. So it kind of incorporates classical education with some other stuff. And the produce is the long-term vision for your homeschool. Seeing, hmm. you know, what, if your child isn't going to the workplace or in the college, what what are they going to do after they turn right. 18 or 21? Yep. Or setting that vision. Mm -hmm. So it's setting the vision right from the start, whether you start kindergarten or 12th grade. That's awesome. Yes. And so art of special needs or parenting. Um, dot com if you're listening on the podcast and you wanted to know where to go so that's where you can find stephanie and we'll have that youtube the link in the youtube description if you are um, catching this on a youtube video as well so um yep and our um youtube viewer came back she goes perfect thank you and thanks stephanie for the pointer so you're awesome so so this has been we're we're already over our hour wow <laughs> So we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely talk a lot um but um but thanks again stephanie for just all that you shared and the wisdom that it's been inspiring um to just just hear your story and um what you're doing with your daughter and it's i'm sure encouraging to many and so thank you so much thank you thank you Peggy. i love being here yeah, and I'm super excited about all the work that you're working on. And Stephanie also works behind the scenes at Sped Homeschool. We um, do some consulting for two different states, and Stephanie helps with that as well. So um, we're excited to have her um, helping out um, with some Sped Homeschool stuff as well. Um, but... Um, but yeah, that just keeps increasing. Um, and I want to thank our audience, too. Thank you all for joining us on Empowering Homeschool Conversations. Um, you know, this is just one of the many resources we have at SPED Homeschool. Um, and you can check out our blogs. Like I said, this turns into a podcast as well. And um, we just have a lot of things going on. And coming this summer super exciting. Um, registration starts a month from today. Um, we are having our first family camp which is going to be awesome. It's going to be in Stewartville, Minnesota. So just by Rochester, the Mayo Clinic area in Minnesota, and we'll have room for 20 families. And so if you are interested in that, um, you can check out our social media, um, has some information right now. We'll have information up on our website soon. Um, but, but we're, we're excited to, to start that in partnership with the Johnny and friends ministry and expand out, is our, our hope into other states after this year so um so anyways that's that's super exciting glad to be able to announce that it's something that's been on my heart for a long time and i can't wait <laughs> so um so anyways next week we are going to continue this topic and like i said we have one of the hslda um, consultants on and we're going to talk about homeschooling your student with diabetes and um just kind of some of the things that come along with that. And so um, our guest is going to share her story, her daughter's story, and just encourage you in that. So I hope that you can join me and my guest then. Um, but it's same time, same place. And, um, and so, so yeah, we'll be, we'll be back here next week. But again, thank you, Stephanie. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Check out Stephanie's um, resources at specialneedsparenting.com. And we'll see you all again next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Here we go. <laughs>